Nicole and Clinton. Hello. Nicole, Hello. We, Nicole you waved as I said Olivia, so I think that's going to confuse <laughs> people at home. But it's a bit, a bit premature. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the enthusiasm shines through. So. Uh, so anyway, uh, really grateful for those of you joining us, whether you're live right now or whether you're watching it after the fact. For those of you that are live, uh, please, uh, we, we want you to be a part of the conversation. So comments, questions, anything, uh, type them in on Facebook there. Um, they'll show up uh, for us here where we can see them. We'll be able to pull those into the conversation. So um, today we have kind of a few topics we're going to touch on. We do want to start off and focus on Beanpole, which is the current film in our virtual cinema. So we're going to talk that, talk about that, kind of share what we thought about that. But um, because it is 420, we thought it would also be fun to talk a little bit about stoner films, maybe some of our favorites, maybe what makes uh, a good stoner film. So if you have thoughts on uh, thoughts on that, um, we'll uh, we'll kind of get to that a little bit later on, and then maybe we'll just uh, chat about some other uh, other things we've been. Uh, watching and doing so sound good any any other orders of business you guys have you hit it yeah i think we're good all right us yeah so beanpole uh for those of you that have not watched it yet is a a, a drama uh out of russia uh directed by uh kantamir bulagov it's his second film he's really young i he's i think his, I his birth date was like 1990 or something like that so <laughs> That was, uh, you know, I had a little bit of a moment there, um, but uh, <laughs> uh, very highly regarded film came out of Russia uh, last year. We were quite excited to have the opportunity to bring it uh, into uh, our virtual cinema. It's set in uh, immediately kind of post-World War II Russia and specifically uh, St. Petersburg. And uh, so uh, focuses on primarily on two uh, female characters, ultimately. Um, who were, uh, I had the impression they were both gunners in the war. Did you guys yeah. catch that as well? Um, so not, uh, not dancers, as I had said last week, for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we had, we had discussed similar? Shall We Dance, which is, uh, uh, right, which is the, uh, the Georgian film. Anyway, yeah. no, I, I knew where you were coming from on that. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, anyway, so that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts uh, of, of where the film kind of is when we start. And we kind of dive in here. But um, I wanted to just kind of throw up here. Uh, this was uh, from Manila Dargis's review of the film. And I really particularly like this kind of line I highlighted here where she said, uh, the men and women in this startling movie don't complain or even speak much about their suffering perhaps because it would be like describing the air that they breathe. So that was a line that I read and I thought that really, to me, feels like it's kind of cutting to, uh, you know, to the core of, uh, of what's going on uh, in, this, uh, in this particular movie. And I guess just to kind of kick things off myself, um, you know, that, that was the thing that struck me the most. And this, this, is a, this is a rough watch, this movie. This is not, uh, you know, a, not a lighthearted film by any means. Um, to me, it was really a film about trauma. And you were just, you were dropped into this world with these people who had all gone through just, you know, tremendous trauma of this sort of war experience. And you're with them in the immediate aftermath of it. And, and I thought that was handled in a really delicate uh, way because, you know, we don't get the kind of heavy handed like, you know, flashbacks or anything like that. Or, you know, so, you know no one's like, well, as you know, during the war, we were <laughs> da, 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 da. You don't even really, in fact, the, the thing about both of the women being gunners, it's one of them. It's very clear that she was that kind of comes up in conversation. But but Beanpole, it's more just reference that they were together in the war. And so you it's you, you left a little more to maybe fill it in. But I guess what I'm getting at is you don't get a lot of those details. Um, characters like the doctor, everyone else, it's clear they were all involved. You don't know a lot of the details of that. But everyone's just living with this kind of trauma. And it's just kind of hanging on them like a weight. And so you're just sort of watching them as they go through those kind of next steps of their lives. And so... Uh, that's some really heavy material, and I think that's something that is not always maybe what you're going to be in the mood to watch. But but if you're looking for that kind of material, I thought it was really well executed here. So that's kind of my initial thoughts. I don't know. What, what, what do you guys think? 
Yeah, um, I think we agree. Um, it is a tough watch, like you said. It's very dark and depressing, and and yet it doesn't um, – like, it's not manipulative. Like, it doesn't say, you know, we're out to make you cry here. Like, we're out to be depressing. It just shows these – state of things in a very austere um, way that's free of ornamentation or flash. Like there's one scene in particular where it kind of, um, where the uh, director um, uh, kind of, where his style is kind of uh, crystallized in that what could be cinematic in this film, he does everything he can to make it uncinematic if it makes sense and the scene that comes to mind is when Masha who's being Paul's friend uh, tries on a green dress and then she asks the uh, dressmaker to twirl in it and you know in a lot of other movies the director might have been uh, tempted to uh, depict that moment with like a slow motion and like a musical score underneath but instead Balagov chooses to just show it in, in a very um plain way that almost shows how pathetic it is like like how futile her attempt of of joy and happiness is in this environment of pain and suffering and like you said ben trauma and to go with the idea of trauma i um also thought it was interesting how like you said the trauma is really unspoken throughout the film, but the two main characters, their trauma is almost embodied through physical reactions um, with the title character, Beanpole. Uh, her trauma is embodied through this kind of seizure that she experiences that actually opens the film, that kind of uh, renders her mute. And like you said, it, 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 it leaves her speechless and unable to literalize or to literally vocalize the trauma that she's experiencing. And with uh, Masha, her trauma is embodied through this recurring uh, nosebleed, which is not related, but we thought she looked alarmingly like Eleven from Stranger <laughs> Things. And we thought, on a side note, is, yeah. is, is, is this a Russian Eleven? What's going on? But anyway. That's my spiel, but yeah. If I could add on to that, just very briefly. Very briefly. Sorry for the ramble. <laughs> it was a thrilling scene in the green dress that I really realized like how great this film was because even in a moment when there should be a lot of life there or when she's trying to be happy and lighthearted and put these tragic things behind her, it's still tragic. And you, it just doesn't allow you to feel that happiness or even a moment of you know, respite in this time. Um, and her twirl, like as she twirls, becomes sad and she starts crying and she gets angry. And that's just this entire film. It does not allow life and happiness to reside anywhere. Yeah. What do you think about that? Like there was not, you thought maybe there would have been lighthearted moments, but. It's an ounce of levity, but really there's yeah. not. No, the, I think the, the pacing of the film also really feels like it's just beating you down so hard. Like there's yeah. just, like, every moment is just like, oh, okay, it keeps, keeps going this way. It's just, <laughs> yeah, everything gets worse. But like, I mean, I, I can't hold it against the film obviously because it's done in such an artful and, and obviously meticulous and very well executed way. But there is something about like I, the mindset of, of myself when I was watching, it was just completely wrong for, for how I, I, like this is something I would have loved to experience in like a, theater like with um, not even other people but just like kind of the weird <laughs> social like being with other people but also isolated at the same time of a theater uh oh <laughs> anyway whatever i'll oh. continue <laughs> but uh but dark but, film we know <laughs> i just was i just feel like the the pacing is is such a a tool in itself of making you feel like this long slog towards we don't nothing <laughs> Like just just this long this long slog towards like whatever you can get your hands on any sort of feeling of of uh, like self sufficiency even yeah can you guys hear me by the way am I back here yeah yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. yeah I cut I cut away there for a second but I see our 
our counter looks like it's still recording, so I'm going to assume that uh, this is working and people will ultimately be able to uh, to see this. <laughs> so, um, no, and Olivia, and you mentioned the just the kind of relentlessness of yeah. the film. And I have to admit, a question I had as I was going through it was, you know, is this just kind of like sadness porn? You know, because I've seen films like that and I've seen films that really just drop a brick on you. And that's it, it's just that kind of one note over and over. And and so, I mean, I have to admit that that did enter my mind as I was watching this. But ultimately, I didn't feel that was the case with this film. And maybe you guys did. Uh, but, um, you know, I felt like there were some small levels there and there were these kind of brief moments of. Um, you know, if not happiness, you kind of saw that the, the characters were working towards something, you know. Um, and so the, the green dress scene is a great kind of microcosm, you know, of, of everything. But I thought even in some of Masha's scenes with the kind of young man that she kind of has a relationship Pasha, with, and yeah. He's, he's, yeah, Pasha, he's so naive and so obviously you know, he hasn't had this kind of wartime experience that she's had. I thought there were a lot of nice moments between them where she almost let her guard down a little bit, or you could at least see her sort of understand that like, oh yeah, this is what it would be like to be sort of, you know, innocent and carefree. And she could sort of maybe let herself uh, play that role for a little bit. Um, you know, that wasn't ultimately going to be her, but I, at the end of the day, I felt like there were enough of those like levels there. And, and it, there was enough, it was enough about these people are genuinely trying to survive through this trauma that I didn't feel like it was just, you know, one of these like, you know, uh, you know, you know, peeling onions in front of me, trying to get me to cry films all the way through. Right. I definitely feel like there is a really fine line between like, especially something like this where it's trying to depict a sort of reality that was for, for many people and like tragedy porn was like, for me, tragedy porn is like, like the second season of like the handmaid's tale where I like watched the first season. And then I started watching the second season and like something clicked in my brain that I was like, I don't have to watch this. <laughs> like, there's nothing forcing me to put myself through like how uncomfortable this makes me feel. And I do think that Beanpole really toes that line with those like small scenes of, of levity. And also just like it, it fleshes out the characters in such a way where even though they spend most of their time in the film suffering, they feel so much like real people that I'm acutely aware that they weren't always suffering. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Um, wh one other thing that just jumped out to me uh, as the film went on, you know, obviously there's this uh, question in the film about becoming pregnant and that's what a lot of the plot ends up kind of hinging on is is uh, you know Masha wants Beanpole to become pregnant with a child for her to raise and she, as she would refer to this she, she'd she often say something like you know I want to I want to feel life inside me or you know that I don't know if you guys noticed that that phrase was used several times and the first few times I kind of thought well, I wonder if that's just kind of a, a quirk of translation and if, you know, that's maybe that's like an artful uh, expression in Russian for, you know, being pregnant that and that's just kind of how it's coming through. But it, it was used repeatedly and especially kind of uh, highlighted in the, the very final scene of the film. And to me, that kind of made it clear that, no, this is a very intentional choice for what they're referring to here, because so much of this idea of you know, the, these these women didn't really feel alive themselves anymore because of the kind of trauma that they've gone through. So there's this idea that, well, if we if we become pregnant, if we have this child, that will be life. And then we will kind of, you know, feel that life ourselves. And and so I, I and I found that, in, you know, kind of interesting thematically, just as it as it played out through the film. We were also, you know, hooked on the, those themes, um, both when she said that, to me, it didn't stand out as much as like, oh, maybe this is a mishap in translation because right from the beginning, I could tell that Masha's character, like she didn't even properly grieve her son because she, because it would have been too hard. And so she just, 
you know, let's go dancing. Like who does that? That's insane. And so it's what she needed to do because what else are you going to do? I mean, so much life had been lost at that moment. So I could tell from the beginning that her character was different. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and so when she said, I want life inside of me. um, And then when you, connect that to the ending when she said, there's no life inside of me, I'm meaningless, when Beanpole said that. I mean, I guess that really is the only thing, they were shells of people at the end of that experience. Um, And that would be the only thing that could give them meaning again. Uh, But Clinton had a good point too about pairing that, like that final um, conversation with the man who she euthanized. Um, If you wanna talk more about that. Yeah. I forgot I made that point, but if you remember, there was a scene in the movie that's one of the more uh, painful scenes in a movie filled with pain, but it's the one where Beanpole, who's a uh, who's a nurse at this uh, soldier hospital, she's instructed to basically euthanize a man who was paralyzed because of his wounds in the war. And it's a very, a uh, slow, excruciating scene that's painful, but but just also extremely sad. And um, in a weird kind of parallel, the way that she speaks about her, how she feels in the end of this, or in the end of the movie, where she says, to some extent, "There's nobody inside me." Obviously, that's a double-voiced moment in that she's not pregnant, but also she has lost a sense of self and, in a way, has become numb just like how the man who was paralyzed became numb to the world and then eventually chose death because he didn't see um, a path towards happiness anymore because he couldn't, like literally he couldn't feel anything or do anything like he, like he used to before the war, but on a more uh, metaphorical level, I guess, um, he just became numb or she became numb to everything around her. Yeah. 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 It, it, one thing we, we haven't mentioned either that I think we should is that this film is absolutely beautiful. I mean, the the cinematography, the production design, every shot of this film, it's like you're looking into a painting and the, the yes. colors are so impossible Lots of greens. and vibrant. Lots mm-hmm. of, a lot of greens and reds yeah. contrasting each other and just um, and and I think that's another one of those elements that keeps it from being just just kind of one note dreary is that there is so much just color and life in terms of you know visually in the world around them so um you can kind of see that like it's right there or there maybe they're still in a world that could offer that they're just not really able to maybe tap into that anymore so um go ahead at the same time too like although the greens are they couldn't be more vibrant um, at least in their apartment building, wallpaper was decrepit and there were patches in the walls. And so it just kind of like um, aids in that theme of like attempted happiness or we're, you know, we're trying to yep. break out of this dreadful scene, but yep. we, you know, it's just yep. there. Yeah. yeah. Like there, um, oh, I, yes, I'm, <laughs> no, I, I was just, I was going to throw it. Yeah, sorry. I, I was just going to throw in like one thing I read. They actually, um, those streetcars they found in, I forget where, some other kind of Eastern European country, they found like decommissioned, um, you know, post war era St. Petersburg streetcars. So they were like oh, wow. 100% authentic. And, and that's a specific story about the streetcars, but everything just has that like just really amazingly yeah. like perfect kind of period look. And you can just tell so much care was taken with that mm-hmm. absolutely yeah and i was just going to say to go along with nicole's point about the decor and the interiors like it's almost as if um the wallpapers and the paint it's it's almost like a physical representation of what they're going through like it's a very temporary and uh weak attempt to cover up their pain with this temporary source of happiness that's in it, that's inevitably going to peel away and decay and what's left underneath is this you know um uh this uh damaged wall just like their damaged psyches or their bodies but 
kind of to go along with the idea of that trauma during the war, we were going to ask you guys what you thought about um, with Masha specifically, how in a scene late in the movie, uh, another character calls into question what she really did during the war. Um, like as we talked about, it's implied at first that she was an anti aircraft gunner, but then later on, it's almost implied that she was some kind of a sex worker. But mm -hmm. we just thought that was interesting how it left her uh, wartime experience ambiguous. But we want to know what you guys thought of that, too. Yeah, I don't know. Olivia, what did you think about that? Um, it's, I was kind of, a, I had a hard time kind of making heads or tails of that in the sense that, like, I don't know enough about like World War II Russian military history. So I was like, could she have been both? I don't I, like, is that just a thing that could have happened where like she yeah. was a, a, a gunner at some point and then also as just like being a, a woman in the military at the time, like this is just also something you do or is it like a specific, um, almost like sanctioned position that exists and that, so she still is like a, um, like a veteran, but she just had this other role that like she doesn't talk about. Um, it seemed very like structured and very like the way she described it, there was like a, a like a hierarchy of some kind. There was very established like structures to this, these like comfort women. And so I'm, I don't know. I just, I wish I had more historical context, which obviously the film can't provide because that would be like impossible to do. But I, I do wish I had more historical context to, to figure out, the, the context of that specific scene. Yeah. I, uh, you know, it's definitely ambiguous, I think, the way it's presented in that scene. Um, the woman, she, she's kind of being, Masha's kind of being accused at that point by yeah. by someone and saying, well, here's what I, here's who I think you are. And so, to, you know, to be honest, my gut instinct was to kind of read it as her just kind of going along with that and saying like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm exactly who you think I am. Um, you know, that not wanting to be bothered yeah. with that. She does, you know, I mean, Masha early in the film, I mean, she's wearing a, when we first see her, she's wearing a military jacket with a number of medals on it and everything. So, so I tend to think that that was actually sort of what her, you know, what she did, but, but it, you know, it's left ambiguous. And I think partly too, it's, it's again, part of the, the whole thing with this film where, uh, you know, all of these people experience trauma and it's not really in, interested in dissecting like exactly what happened to them and well, you know, like finding that key incident that turned them into the person they are today. It's it's kind of got a more sophisticated view of it, I think, which is just they went through, you know, pretty unspeakable situations. And here's who they, you know, kind of here, you're looking at who they are now. And so, um, so anyway, uh, well, on that note, <laughs> turning, turning 180 degrees and, and Beanpole is going to be available until... Uh, Thursday in our virtual cinema. So if you go to DesMoinesFilm.org, um, there's links you can follow there. You can watch the film. Uh, you can watch it on your computer. You can stream it on uh, Apple TV, on a Roku, a uh, number of devices as well. So I definitely encourage you to check it out. It's really a, it's a very interesting film. Um, but today being uh, April the 20th or 420, I thought it would be fun for us to talk a little bit about stoner films specifically as a genre and maybe any particular stoner films that are near and dear to any of us so uh what about what do you guys say are there is this is this a genre that you are you are a fan of and and if so what is it that, that draws you to this genre um i was like very afraid of drugs as like a high schooler <laughs> and also kind of still into adulthood <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very lame adult, yeah. uh, and so yeah. I did not watch uh, that many like quote unquote stoner films uh, as a youth <laughs> or even now. But I have seen. I did research because I was like, "What is a stoner film?" Even I'm not even 100 percent sure. Oh <laughs> uh, I did some research. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I feel like I, you know, I've seen Dave and Confused. I've seen the movie, but uh, there's one that wasn't on any of the lists I saw that I do think falls into this sort of like stoner film vibe without actually, like there is some uh, some drug use in the movie, but it kind of just has the same vibe as this. And it's um, uh, Everybody Wants Some, Richard Linklater's movie from, uh, was it 2013? Mm -hmm. I think it just has that kind of like, 
like not aimless, but it ha it's that kind of genre of movie where there's not a central um, antagonist. There's not really a central like problem happening. It's just people who are interesting hanging out together and being fun and cool. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I feel like that really falls into that same vibe. It's almost like it's ad adopting a lot of the um, hallmarks of the genre without being that exact thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting yeah. that you mentioned that movie because um, I've, I've watched that movie, but I haven't seen the movie that I've heard it's basically a continuation of, which is Dazed, Dazed and Confused, which yeah. was Linklater's own film from like, early 90s, which I've mm -hmm. heard is a seminal um, movie in this genre. But again, I think that begs a question, would donor movies like, should they be considered a genre, like a Western or a sci-fi? Because I think that's really the burning question here, um, if you can excuse <laughs> the pun. But, uh, <laughs> I think they have to be their own genre, otherwise they're too stupid to watch. So I think that, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're a lot of fun, but I mean, um, yeah, I would never watch Cheech and Chong if it didn't have that, you know, um, I guess just like. The je ne sais quoi of it all. Yeah, right? Like, you know why you're watching this film. And so um, it's not a favorite genre if we're gonna say it's a genre of mine. Um, but I do have some favorites like The Big Lebowski is so great and definitely centers around, you know, the dude getting high all the time. That's like his lifestyle. Um, another favorite, just to mention, uh, Fast Times at Richmond High is so good and funny. And along with that, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, which is like the original uh, Wayne's World, if you haven't seen that. Have either of you seen the Bill and Ted movies? Oh I yeah, not. Oh, I am yeah. not. That's that's a real blank spot in my uh, my repertoire. They're actually coming out with a new one, which is crazy to with think Keanu about. Reeves, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, those are some good ones to mention from from my end. Yeah, yeah, no, interesting. Well, I feel like I'm maybe more of a stoner movie fan <laughs> than uh, <laughs> than the rest of us here. But uh, no, those are some really good. I uh, those are some really good uh, titles. I think, and and I think that. Uh, Lebowski is definitely a film that jumps yeah. out to me that I, I think about. And and uh, truth be told, and I know this is kind of a basic opinion, but if I had to pick an absolute favorite film, I really honestly might pick The Big Lebowski. I mean, it is just, it's it's probably, it's probably the movie that I have watched more times than any other film ever. Uh, you know, it didn't, I remember when it came out and I was a big Coen Brothers fan at the time. And it just, it disappeared almost immediately in theaters. I didn't see it in theaters. It, it had a real short shelf life. And then I feel like everyone kind of discovered it on, uh, you know, DVD, uh, basically, when it, you know, kind of came out then. Because that's where I remember seeing it was someone brought it over to my apartment in college and we watched it there. And it was, you know, like this revelatory moment. And then, um, you know, we sort of became obsessed with it after that. Actually, when I moved to Los Angeles in 2002, it was about a month before they tore down the uh, Hollywood lanes, which was the bowling alley that they bowled out <laughs> in the film. Uh, and so, cause they were gonna, they were gonna put in a public school. And, uh, Ooh, so, that's pretty edgy. So one of the, one of the very first things I did when I moved to Los Angeles, I went out with a friend and we went bowling there. And uh, that's cool. they had actually changed the interior of the place. They'd remodeled it like very shortly after the film had been shot. So most of the interior looked different. They still did have the, the the stars that are kind of like behind the lanes there that are very kind of iconic. Mm -hmm. Those are still up there, but a lot of the other stuff looked uh, looked very different. So, but it was still kind of cool to check it out. Nice. Um, so it's not there anymore. They tore it all down, or what's that? Oh yeah, they tore it. They tore it all down. And you know, it's funny because then it wasn't too long after that that you know Lebowski Fest started and that kind of thing, and it really became its own sort of cottage industry and so if it, you know even five years later i think there would have been kind of a call to um mm -hmm. you know to preserve it but but uh, it didn't happen um public but, uh, schools though haven for drug use so it could just be an homage yeah <laughs> true yeah. true did you hear um, that, uh oh no go ahead um i was just gonna say um did you hear that john turturro apparently directed a indirect yeah sequel to the movie called the jesus rolls <laughs> i don't think it ever got a theatrical release but um, well it's it was actually supposed to be coming out this spring 
um, finally. It was delayed like many, many times. And, um, and then I think ultimately that was even sort of hung up by the you know whole COVID nineteen thing, so mm-hmm. I'm not sure if it's available anywhere now, but but I think it's been done for like five years, and so yeah. you know usually when a movie takes that long to come out, it's because it's really really good. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, your opinion. Right. That's, that's just your opinion, man. Uh, so, but oh. you know, Lebowski for me, the other thing that's great about it to me as a as sort of a stoner film is it's not just about getting stoned, you know, and there's Mm -hmm. sort of this other genre of stoner films like your Pineapple Express and these kind of films, which which are and I enjoy some of those and they're kind of funny, but they also they just feel a little on the nose for me. And so they're actually they're not quite as fun. Uh, A little one note. A little one note. Whereas, you know, Lebowski, I mean, it's he's just this amazing character with these kind of grand aspirations that he's just too fucking lazy to follow through <laughs> on, which to me feels like it cuts much more to, you know, the core of that kind of, uh, you know, the uh, stoner culture, if you will. Um, but uh, I, the, the one movie I was going to mention, though, that is, it's a little more in that kind of um, uh, obvious, uh, you know, uh, stoner movie kind of genre, but I absolutely love is uh, Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Uh, Have you guys no. all seen this? I haven't seen it. We should have pre-gamed this. We should have pre-gamed this a lot more before we started. I guess it's only 8.30. So. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, right. right so, so, I, recommend, I recommend it highly. Uh, just again, it, it's, I, I just, I love the simplicity of it. You know, it's two guys, they get stoned and they want some White Castle. And then that launches them on this adventure. And I just, as a, I mean, coming from screenwriting myself, they're just the, the beauty and the economy of that. I really, I really love um, the, the director of the film, actually a couple years earlier, he had directed a dude, where's my car. Oh, I've seen that. Yeah. Dude, where's <laughs> so, my car yeah. featuring <laughs> Iowa's own Ashton Kutcher. Yeah. So. And again, this like, they're, they're, part they're, of my car. <laughs> they're, uh, yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're stupid. They're kind of like, you know, stupid movies, but like, but they're, the economy is just so brilliant, right? It's like, you know, it, you don't have to have like all of the superheroes of the universe trying to get all the, you know, gems and the little fist thing of the bad guy, right? You can just be like, you woke up after a rough night and you're like, dude, where's my car, right? So that's, <laughs> that's enough for a movie. And so, anyway. So those are a couple that I love, but uh, I don't know any other specific films or. Uh, we have just, to uh, mention the ultimate yellow submarine. Um, oh, yeah, nice. so great! We actually got to watch it at the Varsity before it closed, which was really cool. Um, for its sixtieth, what? Fiftieth. Uh, Fifty. Oh, fiftieth. Yeah. Uh, Sixty-nine. So it would have been in like 2019. Yeah, it's a trip of a movie. 68. And Uh high or not high, it's a great movie, full (laughs) of great music and beautiful colors. And Uh it is pretty clever too, because it's the Beatles and they're just goofy. Um, And a lot of blue and mean, blue meanings. (laughs) Yeah. But along with that, it kind of um, bridges the genre of stoner movies from obviously movies about donors to another subgenre, which is just colorful psychedelic adventures. Um, yeah. I, I think one that comes to mind is 2001 for the infamous Stargate sequence at the end. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously there's been a lot of um, attempts to re to recreate or to replicate that, but I still think that's probably the ultimate psychedelic experience on screen, unless you guys have another, um, suggestion that comes to mind, but that and Yellow Submarine are probably two of our favorites of that type of stoner film. Stimulating, yeah. 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 It's almost like a subgenre of like things that feel like they could be a drug trip of some kind. Like when skin comes to mind or, um, I don't know, that's the one that jumped out at me first, but any, any kind of thing like that where you're kind of watching it go along and then all of a sudden you're like, what is happening anymore? Like, this is going off the rails. Yeah, yeah or just, yeah, movie, movies that are more fun to watch when you're high, right? That's, <laughs> you know, 
That's the thing. And no, I agree. Something like 2001 is a great, great example. Uh, I show that in an intro to film class pretty regularly. I am not high while I'm showing it in my intro to film class. So in case any of my higher up. Rate right my professor. But, uh, <laughs> right, my professor, yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, no, there's, I mean, that's that's kind of its whole its whole, you know, subgenre as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, and I think it's the reason that this comes up is, you know, I mean, you know, marijuana is uniquely well, uh, uh, uniquely a, a good choice to watch films on, right? So it's a little, uh, you know, different than, uh, you know, you don't see a lot of like drunk movies, right? You don't see a lot of movies yeah. just for like angry drugs, right? But, Pulp Fiction. Maybe yeah. it's like episodes of The Simpsons. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. anyway, anyway, well, uh, you know, if anybody has any other uh, uh, stoner films that they're a fan of or just uh, anything related, uh, feel free to drop a comment uh, in there. But uh, before we wrap up, I just kind of wanted to ask you guys uh, if there's just anything else you guys have seen lately that you feel like was interesting, worthwhile. Um, last week, a friend of mine and I, we've been having like virtual movie nights and uh, we had planned on watching, rewatching Parasite and uh, five minutes before we we're going to start, I texted her and I was like, can we do something lighter? I just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in the right headspace for this. So instead uh, we revisited the Simpsons movie from 2000 <laughs> and I got to say, I just, I, as a person who has loved the Simpsons my whole life. There's something so weird about watching that in yeah. 2020. <laughs> and just, it does not feel the same. Like the, the 2007 of it all is real palpable. Hmm. And uh, it's an, it makes for a very interesting rewatch because I remember, I mean, in 2007, I was, what, 13, <laughs> 13, 14. And so it was like the funniest thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I've seen it a couple times since then, thought it was great. And then I, watching it last week, I was like, there's something that is not connecting anymore. Even though I still love The Simpsons, I still watch old seasons. There's something about the movie specifically where I'm like, this is just not working for me on the same level that it used to. And so it's, it's, I don't know, it sounds like it wouldn't be fun to rewatch it, but it, it is to kind of watch it with, with modern eyes. Especially because it seems to me like the movie is almost the last good episode of The Simpsons. And it, you can see where it's just like, oh, it's so close. And then it just falls apart. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and that kind of raises a unique question for me that's not really related to anything else that we're talking about, but the fact that 2007 yeah, has seconds. a feel, you know, like I feel like- <laughs> It is like, like just on the cusp of the Obama year where we're like starting to figure it out and it's like not quite there yet. Yeah, interesting. because that, yeah, that's interesting because I feel like the 90s have a feel, the 80s have a feel, but I guess, do the mid-2000s have a feel? I guess they do. Yes. I yeah. think they have an extremely palpable feel to them. <laughs> interesting. Um, All right, uh, Clinton, Nicole, yeah, what you guys? We, um, we watched the same things. So we watched um, Adam's Rib, which I want to highlight. Um, Their with picture Catherine is so much more sophisticated than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm in a button up. Come on. Here. Yeah, I'm <laughs> so, oh, okay. Okay. yeah, great. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, balance. Okay. So Adam's rib, Spencer Tracy, or Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn. Uh, great. I guess courtroom drama, husband, wife, lawyer, duo take the same case opposite sides. And it's about, you know, Catherine Hepburn turns it into a case about equality between the genders and, um, watch it. I watch it on TCM, and um, I don't know where else you would be able to get it. Yeah, um, it's it might be on Canopy. It's probably on Prime at least to rent. But yeah, it's from 1949. Um, and extremely progressive and ahead of its time. It's like quite a marvel that the movie was made and released when it was. But it's it it's aged extremely well. We yeah. thought so. Yeah, I highly yeah. highly. It, it was hilarious too, as they are so together. Classic school. Yeah. yeah. What nice. about you, Ben? Nice. Well, um, uh, just to make Olivia feel better, uh, I did pay twenty dollars <laughs> to uh, oh, my yeah. kids to watch uh, Trolls World Tour the other night. So 
Um, All right, see ya. Have a good yeah. <laughs> no, I'm gonna, I need an in-depth yeah. review. I really need to know what this was. I'm never going to watch it, so I need a review of this. Yeah, it's uh, it's about nine. It's about ninety minutes long. Um, so that's, that's too extent, long. That's the that's the extent of my review, I think. So uh, <laughs> just looking at your watch. No. You know what? I had a I had a five year old who really wanted to watch it, and we paid for it, and he watched it and enjoyed it. And so in in this present situation, it's like, all right, that was Served that was worth us. doing. That was worth doing. Um, no, I was going to mention a documentary that's on Netflix. Uh, called Crip Camp, um, which I managed to see at the True False Film Festival, uh, gosh, like the week, it was like March 6th or something like that. It was like right before everything got shut down. Um, but they did have the festival and we were down there. Have, have you guys watched it by chance on Netflix? I've, I've watched parts of it. I've definitely seen clips on, there were a lot of clips circulating on Instagram yeah. recently and I've seen some of those. Yeah. So it's it's basically, it, it's, a, it's a very straightforward documentary. It's... Um, uh, it's and it's the story of it, it starts off and it centers on this uh, summer camp for uh, people with developmental disabilities, which you know they call you know cripple camp, crip camp is kind of where the title comes from. Um, and uh, it's in the early '70s, and uh, they have all this great uh, archival footage from from that time, as well as interviews with these people afterwards, kind of about this experience and. It, it's shocking to see what it was like for someone with disabilities at that time compared to what it's like now. And this was, of course, you know, pre any kind of federal equality legislation. And it, you know, and a lot of these these people, they, you know, they their school districts might have offered them nothing. So they were, you know, like at home, you know, like in the basement, basically. And then this camp was their like one chance to go out and kind of like connect with people. So this camp was really important, but it blossoms beyond that because a lot of the uh, people who were uh, counselors at this camp or campers at this camp went on to in the mid and late seventies be the leaders of the uh, of the movement for uh, equality rights for for disabled people that ultimately led to the Americans with Disabilities Act and several other things. And there's a there's a very famous and uh, lengthy sit in that they staged in San Francisco that kind of led to a breakthrough in all this. And it's really kind of a uh, an important end uh, point. Uh, or, or extension of the civil rights movement. It really grew out of the civil rights movement that kind of extended into this area. But yet it's kind of a, a, a part of a, that story that I think a lot of us probably haven't seen. I mean, I was kind of aware of some of those broad strokes, but to really see it, see it happen is uh, incredibly interesting and, and really moving too. I mean, absolutely moving. There's a, a point where they have to get transported, the, all these protesters, and I think they're in D.C. at the time, and they've got to move somewhere. There's no, there's no vans with lifts. There's no, I mean, there's, there is not accessible ways to move people. So uh, a group of Teamsters get like a truck that they can move them in, like a moving truck, and they lower the ramp, and they, and all these, you know, and, and quite a few of them are in in wheelchairs. Uh, they get into the back of this box truck. And then they, you know, like close the lid down and drive them across town. And they actually have audio that was recorded at the time of them. And they're like singing to try to like keep their spirits up. But they're just in the dark in the back of this truck, uh, you know, moving, you know, moving through there. So so even though, uh, you know, it's a pretty straightforward documentary, it's kind of, you know, talking heads and archival footage and that kind of stuff. The uh, the material is so striking, and so I was really I was really moved quite a bit watching it, and so I, I recommend it highly. Um, it is produced by uh, Barack and Michelle Obama's uh, company, who um, last year produced American Factory, mm -hmm. which uh, ended up winning the Academy Award. It was a great film, and honestly, yeah, yeah. between these two films, I think you can really kind of see sort of a uh, you know an aesthetic there um, that they were. Uh, uh, you know, that, that, of, of what interests them, which is frankly, you know, uh, stories of kind of, uh, you know, untold stories of America or maybe like, you know, the real America or things like that. I mean, it sounds kind of cheesy, but at least in these two films so far, they've really, you know, kind of found some some pretty good material there. So, all right, I think we're, we're wrapping up here, but we got a comment here. <laughs> Lots of good ones. We're, we're jumping back. We're jumping back into the stoner films here. All right, so we've got we got quite a few. Yeah, that's with Dave Chappelle. I forgot about that one. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Alice uh, in Wonderland is a great pick too. Yeah, wow. I'm, I'm, that seems like such a slam dunk, and I can't believe I didn't even think about it. <laughs> right on, Rosie. Yeah, <laughs> I'm assuming she needs one from the '50s and not the Johnny Depp one. Well, I'm talking Johnny Depp. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. pretty applicable. Yeah, I would think so. I would think so too. And Hair of Vice too, isn't? Did you guys like yeah. Hair of Vice? I yes, owned I that on DVD for two years and never watched it. So okay. <laughs> now is the time. Yeah. <laughs> I think I sold it back to half price books at some point. So like, I'm never going to watch this. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I was thinking Easy Rider too, um, although it's not like pleasant. There is like drug use in that movie and like some uh, right. psychedelic you know, scenes, I guess. But oh, oh yeah, right. yeah. Vice. <laughs> yeah, I just happen yeah. to have an inherent vice. Uh, that's very convenient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just happen yeah, to have it down here. So, um. <laughs> yeah. The thing that yeah. I remember the most um, from that movie is just that how incoherent and hard to follow the plot is because it's based on a Thomas Pynchon right. novel and right. is kind of uh, an homage to the uh, film noir genre. And a lot of you know old noirs are really convoluted and twisty and lab and labyrinthian in their plots, but this one. It's a real doozy, and 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 it just feels like the whole movie is just filled with the haze of marijuana smoke. So it's a really interesting movie. Yeah, um, yeah. I I really enjoy I really enjoy parts of it, and I would definitely recommend it overall. It it it's so it has so much DNA with Lebowski, I think, too, though you know, because it's this kind yeah. of kind of you know stoner private detective kind of story that goes all over the place. Is a little. Um, you know, uh, yeah, uh, but uh, so you know, even though I feel like maybe it's not quite as, uh, as as brilliant as Lebowski, that's that's a pretty high bar. It's still that's still a pretty good one. So, so thank you. Very Rachel. high, Some high, high bar. bar. Very <laughs> high bar. Yeah, Got it. myself out. Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, so I think should we get? We actually gone a little long today, so we should probably probably wrap it up. Um, so thank you guys so much. Uh, I was just going to mention for anybody who sticks around to the end of the stream, uh, we are this week hoping to expand our virtual cinema to offer two films at a time. So that's really exciting. And one of those films uh, we can uh, officially announce right now, and that is Corpus Christi, which I know a lot of people have been looking forward to. So I will just kind of play us out here with the trailer to Corpus Christi. So uh, thank you guys. Uh, and uh, thanks people for watching and commenting and hopefully folks will check back in next Monday. So here is Corpus Christi coming soon to a uh, virtual cinema near you. All right. So. Kiedy Bóg do nas mówi? Czasami zdarza mi się popełnić jakiś grzech, jakieś zło. Czasami myślimy, że niemożliwe, żeby Bóg tak chciał. W imię Ojca i Syna i Ducha Świętego. Amen. O której masz się stawić w stolarni? O 16. Na żadę. A co, nie macie gdzie spać w tej stolarni? W jakiej stolarni? A skąd jesteś? Księdzem jestem. To ja przedstawię. Zaprowadzę do proboszcza ucisz. Gołom Wojciech. Ksiądz Tomasz. Myślę, kto mógłby mnie zastąpić. No ale co, muszę i wszystko. I nie tylko. Widziałem tablicę ze zdjęciami. Bóg tak chciał. Bóg chciał zabić się do osób? Słyszałem, że ksiądz wypytuje o tego kierowcę. Ja nawet rozumiem ciekawość, tylko śledztwo jest już zamknięte. Mam prawo rozmawiać z wiernymi, o czym tylko chcę. Żadne seminarium nie przyjmie cię z wyrokiem. Pani Lidia, to co nie są mi już księdzu opowiadała. Tak? Po co wszystko rozpierdalasz, co? Mówię ci, w czym jesteśmy dobrze? W skreślaniu. Pokazywaniu palcem. Wybaczyć to nie znaczy zapomnieć. Wybaczyć to kochać. Kochać kogoś pomimo jego winy. Jakby nie była.